Hello and welcome to the Tuesday Total Soccer Show. My name is Daryl Grove and I'm joined by a man who's got all the medals. It's Taylor <laughs> Rockwell. Hello. All the medals except for the Europa League medal. That's and, it. And the US Open Cup. Well, that too. <laughs> <laughs> so on, on today's show, Taylor... And many other ones, to be fair. <laughs> We're going to be previewing um, the Europa League final, which is Wednesday afternoon, Manchester United versus Ajax in Stockholm. We're also going to be talking to Pete Karingi III, who's a centre forward for Christos FC, an amateur team from Baltimore who recently knocked out our very own Richmond kickers from the US Open Cup. So we're going to talk to Pete about how you pull off a giant killing. That's right. And Daryl, I wanted to yes and you because I know we're not supposed to say no, but I actually have won the US Open Cup, just so you know. (laughs) I know that you haven't. Mm-hmm. 1987. <laughs> I was three. It was, a, it was a big deal for me. Well, that's similar to the uh, the age difference on a lot of the Ajax team. <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> so <laughs> we're going to be previewing Man United Ajax. I think we're going to be doing sort of like things to know on each side. Mm-hmm. You're going to yeah. have some Man United stuff to tell me. I've got some Ajax stuff to tell you. Um, but spoiler alert, there's a lot of teenagers and early 20-somethings on this team. Yes, there are. To to the extent that, like, I like that. Uh, I think it's Davy Klassen, the captain of Ajax, is considered like the old head. He's twenty four. Yeah, like that's ridiculous. He's past it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. He's kind I mean, of actually. On. The consensus is we'll talk maybe a bit about this later. He's past mm. the era divisi. It's like he's aged out and yeah. he's ready for a move to sort of um, a, a bigger European league. That's the way it goes. That's <laughs> the way it goes. Um, so yeah, once again, the game is two forty five Eastern. It's going to be. Um, in the US, US mm-hmm. Eastern, but it's being played in Stockholm, Sweden. Taylor, we're going to preview it with five or so things to know about each yeah. team. We're not very good at staying on number, right? So you want to no, get, we're not. You want to get us started with the first thing to know about Manchester United. Sure. And I think I'm going to start with something maybe away from the game a little bit. Uh, I'm going to say the chant that you're probably going to hear very loud at the beginning of this game is going to be Manchester United supporters. And the song they're singing is going to be called We'll Never Die, which is one of their like... Most popular songs that they sing, it's one that most fans would know. I think it has references to the Munich Air Disaster, but it is supposed to be sort of a, uh, a hallmark of the club that, you know, they're ageless, they're always there, and it's always about supporting the club. And I think in this case, it's maybe a reference to uh, the events that happened in Manchester uh, last night, uh, went Monday night. Yeah, so yeah, it's, we were talking off air, right? It's not normally our place to talk about these, no. kind, these kind of things, like terrorist attacks, but um, this does sort of cast a shadow over this game. Like One, because, you know, it's Manchester United, they're from Manchester. Mm-hmm. Um, and two, I think even Peter Bosch, the Ajax coach, said, you know, it actually takes yeah. a bit of the shine off the game because some things are just bigger than soccer. Yeah, and I think, like, for me personally, it, it was hard. Like, I want, wanted to write some tweets about this. I wanted to ask some questions of people. And it just felt like every time, like, it was kind of wrong because every time I would go to write something, either uh, the Total Soccer Show Twitter feed or my personal Twitter feed would have more information about the bombings or the uh, kind of the victims and the fallout. And it just didn't feel appropriate. But I also am kind of a believer that uh, these attacks are designed to make people afraid and to make people not want to leave their homes and not want to be a part of their community and fear the people around them. And I think the best way that people can respond to them is to watch this game and to be with friends and to be with your community. And so I think it is important to do stuff like this and talk about soccer and remember that there are, are good things in the world. Yeah, and it's, this is a little off topic in terms of soccer, but the one thing that really heartened me last night was seeing um, like people taking in people who were like far yep. away from home and hotels, letting people stay there for free, all that kind of stuff. Like people really coming together in a way that sort of yeah does exactly what you're talking about. And even uh, I'll say this: like I am a Manchester United fan having never been to Manchester before. Uh, But it was interesting to see a lot of different message boards that I was checking out today were like some of the top posts were city fans coming there to say like I was absolutely rooting against you because it would have been hilarious if you all didn't make the champion like make the Champions League next year. Now I am absolutely rooting for you. And it is that kind of that's the thing that is easy to forget about soccer about football that it really can bring people together and bridge those divides. And that's one of the many reasons why we love it so much. It's one of those things that the rivalry if you're doing it right the rivalry is almost not real like you don't right. really have hate in your heart you just have um sort of a competition with your neighbor in your heart if you're doing yeah. it correctly yeah and i think i think and again moving away from things for a second i think like a lot of our fans in richmond or our friends excuse me in richmond are liverpool supporters and it will never be like i love that guy except that he's a liverpool fan it's more of it's a way to love them more because it allows you <laughs> to talk talk about things and tease them a little bit but generally speaking it's from a basis of love 
And hello to freshly minted Liverpool fan, Eric Jensen Jr. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so that's one thing. I really do think you'll hear that song. Uh, da 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 Yeah, you'll I know. It. That's I know the way it begins. And, uh, and yes, I think that will be a nice way for uh, United fans to kind of remind everyone that sport is important, but some other things are more important. Well, should we switch gear into into like the focus of what's going to happen on the field in this yeah. game? Um, do you want to go again? Like, Give me another Manchester United thing. Sure. Because so I'll, I I'll think, tell you why. We said five things, and I know you're a yeah. United fan, so you probably have like 27 things you want to tell me. I refuse to comment on the number <laughs> of things that I have, but there are, there are multiple. I think the biggest one, I'm going to go with kind of the standard talking point for this game, the one that everybody seems to have fixated on, and I'm going to as well, is who starts in goal for Manchester United. Okay. I think the, I think the answer is going to be Sergio uh, Romero, <laughs> not Aguero, and not Ramos. That would have been weird. Uh, Sergio Romero, I think, Sergio will Aguero would have been goal. fun for all kinds of reasons. Though. Yeah, yeah, right? <laughs> it, it's, it's a risky decision to start an opponent striker that doesn't play for you yeah um and it points to i've heard a lot of people talking about does this mean that david de gea is leaving has he already handed in a transfer request is a transfer already agreed is this Mourinho's way of kind of snubbing de gea um i do sort of think that maybe there's a chance that de gea uh has already filed that paperwork i also think there's like maybe a five percent chance that he actually starts and this is all head games but in the end i think it is going to be sergio romero and that will be a talking point one way or the other well wait wait let's roll it back a bit for maybe for people yeah. who haven't been paying attention to manchester united like you have all season yeah. um why is sergio romero starting in goal sure or why so is he even expected to start over david de gea when that has not been what's happening in the premier league at all ever no, it's not. But that's because this is not the Premier League. David yeah. Hay is Manchester United's uh, starter in goal in the Premier League. It has been Romero. I think 11 of the 14 games in the Europa League have been started by Sergio Romero. David Hay has started in the other three. Uh, but David Hay is by far the best goalkeeper on this team. I, and then maybe one of the top five, top three best goalkeepers in the not, world. Not depending getting on your into perspective. it. Not getting into yeah. it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> But I and so I think some people have that's been the kind of standard argument uh, to which I was referring of if you have this amazing goalkeeper, why wouldn't you start him? You, you start the best 11 you have sentiment, sentimentality be damned. Or and I, the, the, uh, the counterpoint is dance with mm-hmm. the one what brung you, right? If Sergio Romero's got yep. you all the way to the Europa League final, then you stick with him. And I know Mourinho has previous in this. I remember Carlo Cudicini starting yep. um, a League Cup final for Chelsea because he'd been there all the way and he started over Petr Cech. I think, yep. I think just because of Mourinho's um, loyalty to players, I think, he, I think he goes with Romero. Yeah, I agree. And I also think, um, as my dogs agree, apparently, as well, um, I also think that it goes back to Sir Alex Ferguson, that he would always play the young, the young kids in the Carlin Cup, and there would always be calls for if they made the final, that he should play the old guard and he should win this title. But it was always kind of about giving people the experience. And I think I do kind of commend Mourinho for sticking with Sergio Romero. That said, if he lets in a howler, if he doesn't have as good of a game, maybe I'll be singing a different tune tomorrow afternoon. <laughs> All right, on to the opponents then, Ajax. Mm. Um, I feel like a lot of people will only start paying attention to Ajax roundabout now. Like if people who are not Eredivisie fans, but they're just, you know, fans of, say, European football, uh, maybe only thinking about the Europa League right now, right? Um, The thing to know about Ajax is this, as you watch the game, they are going to press. Yep. Peter Bosch is going to press. He said he, yep. he didn't play for Ajax. He's, he's an older guy. He didn't play for Ajax in the 70s and 80s, but he loved watching that team play. And when he got the coaching job, he decided he wanted them to play the Ajax way, the total football, which does involve a lot of pressing. So, so expect, expect a squeeze from Ajax. Can I tell you the thing that I saw that absolutely terrified me that I didn't know until today? What's I've that? asked you, but now I'm just going to tell you. Um, do you remember when we were talking about like the two teams that we wish we could see play in a couple? Like, it was maybe a couple months ago when we were picking two teams to play against each other, and mine was the Dutch team from the 70s because yeah. of that crazy pressing. Mm-hmm. That's what he showed his players at the beginning of the season. Right? He showed them that footage of them doing that crazy swarm that I think I saw somebody describe as almost looking like U6s, that like yes. it's just a bunch of kids cramming together and really making it difficult. And that's kind of what they do. They make it really difficult for you to have possession, for you to be confident on the ball because there are so many players around you trying to win it off you. Now, I did see, I think you sent this to me. It was um, a Reddit post by yes. Epic Floyd, username yes. Epic Floyd, which is a, f- a perfect Reddit name. Yeah. Um, from a Manchester United fan perspective, but with some knowledge of Ajax. Mm-hmm. And Epic Floyd seemed kind of torn between, oh, we can maybe just play our way over the top of this and maybe a long ball to Fellaini and then he flicks it on and we're clear of the press. Or, oh no, we're going to get crushed by the Ajax press. 
Yep, that's more or less the uh, the fear, and I think it's a lot of fans uh, going back and forth on, uh, or Manchester United fans uh, that is going back and forth on. Do you try to play out of that press? Do you try to hunker down and invite that pressure and then counterattack? And it doesn't seem like a lot of people have a lot of ideas or a lot of good ideas as to how to deal with that pressure. Now, how certain are we that Peter Bosch is going to go with that in this game? Like, is there a chance that like Man United are, I believe, the best team he's faced this year? Right, with all due mm-hmm. respect to say Schalke and Leon, who they played in the the quarterfinals, and all due respect to Feyenoord who won the Eredivisie. Um, I think United are the biggest and best team they've played this year. Is there a chance he's sort of like, okay, these guys are smart. Maybe we hold off a bit. Or is it just like, hey, watch that video from the 74 again and let's go get him. Mm -hmm. I mean, (laughs) to to quote you from moments ago, what, dance with the one what brung you? I mean, it doesn't really make sense, I think, to change the tactics that have been working for you, that have worked for you all season, that you've practiced all season, to suddenly be like, never mind, everybody sit back. It should work. <laughs> so I think you are going to see that that high tempo press, that high line, uh, lots of players swarming. I think that's definitely what Ajax are going to be doing. Okay. Tell me mm-hmm. something else about Man United then. Sure. So with that in mind, I will say that uh, part of the debate has been about what United are going to do in midfield. Because I think uh, based on the rest that they gave people this weekend, it seems like it's going to be under Herrera. It seems like it's going to be Paul Pogba. Michael Carrick and Maron Fellaini are the other options there. Because I do think it'll be like a 4-3-3, a 4-3-2-1 for United. And the question is, do you go with Michael Carrick, who I think is more of the possession midfielder, slows it down a little more cerebral, versus Marwan Fellaini, who is Marwan Fellaini. And I think <laughs> it... it who he starts there will show you what their approach is going to be. If it's going to be sitting back a little bit and focusing more on possession and swinging the ball from left to right, uh, that's Michael Carrick. If it's much more long balls and being physical and being aggressive early, I think that's Marilyn Fellaini. That's interesting because that's two ways out of the press, right? You can go mm-hmm. um, when because to just be clear, I actually going to sound like many, many men swarming the ball which mm-hmm. means that you're sort of crushed like back and to the one side of the field, right? So you can yep. either say go long to Maron Fellaini, who you know, can take it on his chest or can flick it on. He's like, for, for all the um, sort of jokes made about him, he's very, yep. very, very, very good at doing that, right? He's yes, a great he target man in a way that like the ball sticks to him or goes where you want it to go, right? So you can play long ball with some control. But the alternative is to have someone like Michael Carrick, who's so great at sort of switching the field, right? So he could play out of pressure, like from, say, the right wing to the left wing instead of all the way forward. So maybe if we see Carrick or we see Fellaini, we'll inform how Mourinho plans to get out of this one. Exactly. But I think both of them have their downsides because Carrick can be a little bit slower on the ball. And I think it does mean that United are going to try to focus on stringing passes together, which mm-hmm. I think is what Ajax want them to do. Fellaini, for his part, it means it's going to be a little bit more disjointed at times because it is going to be a little more direct. He also has shown himself at times this season to be a bit of a liability when it comes to defending. <laughs> uh, so there's also that concern as well. Either way, I think it's going to make for an interesting uh, match because I think either it's going to be an exciting United being, United being very aggressive and trying to get goals early, Or it's going to be United sitting back and Ajax being very aggressive. Either way, I think it's going to be uh, pretty fun to watch from a neutral perspective. I think so too. And Mm -hmm. key to that is going to be the the Ajax striker that everybody's talking about. Mm -hmm. So it's not just in Clivert. Patrick Kluivert's son, because he tends not to start, even though he's been getting some press because he's Patrick Kluivert's son, right? Yep. But the guy everybody's talking about with good reason is young Danish striker. I believe he's 19, Kasper Dolberg. Here's how I've heard him described. He's being coached by Dennis Bergkamp. He finishes like Marco van Basten, and he's probably the next Latan Ibrahimovic. I've heard of those guys. (laughs) Yes. Um, And that sounds ridiculous, right, to hear all that. But watching like highlights of Kasper Dolberg is how I spent my afternoon. Um, and a very, it's a very uh, pleasant way to while away half an hour or so. Yep. Um, you really can see um, all those skills. Like he's got such a great sort of... Um, uh, like when the ball comes to him, he's got that good little movement that just shakes someone loose and makes some space for himself. Yep. So he can like weave and turn. But And you know, there's players who can do that. But he's also got this weird sort of directness like as soon as a gap opens up he goes through it as if it's a door that's about to close he goes charging through it like indiana jones coming out of the temple of doom and he never forgets his hat which (laughs) is the key thing which means he's never stopping (laughs) he's also got Uh, an incredible shot on him i keep seeing him like with um really like hard finishes to the low corner like really really hard there's a story i didn't read the full story but i saw something about him breaking the fan's arm yesterday (laughs) if i'd clicked on that headline what would it have told me is it true did he shoot into the crowd and break a fan's arm I don't know. I mean, I, I heard that, that he, uh, with a wayward shot, yes, is the headline that I see now. I Basically, I've done the exact same thing you did. I saw the headline, and so I was just going to throw that out there, beat, beat me to it. Well done, Daryl Grove. <laughs> I feel like one of us should have read the story, but let's just say we saw the headline and we just took it at face value. 
Nah, seems like a whole thing. Yeah. <laughs> so keep an eye on Casper Dolberg. Yes, and I think that leads into uh, my next point is who is it that's going to be keeping an eye on Casper Gold? <laughs> uh, because Eric Bailly, who has been the kind of rock of Manchester United's defense this season at times because it's been pretty turbulent, he is suspended. He got a red card against oh. Celta, Celta Vigo oh, in the yes. sixth leg. Okay. Mm-hmm. So he will not be there. So then the question is, who starts at center back? Uh, I think the conventional wisdom is that it's going to be Daly Blind and Phil Jones. It might be Chris Smalling in there. Uh, either way, it's going to be difficult because I think it's going to be relying upon those center backs to uh, obviously do the marking job, make sure everybody's marked up, make sure everyone's doing a good job of blocking that Ajax attack, which is pretty potent, but also helping transition, helping get out of that pressure and helping find those long balls. And so I think that maybe lends itself towards Daly Blind starting and then maybe having Phil Jones is the kind of roaming power center back. You mean roaming go head it away center back? Yeah, that's it. <laughs> I do. I do love Phil Jones in a in a sort mm-hmm. of very. Uh, I don't. Know, I must feel like paternalistic. You know what I mean? Like I just. I feel like he um, his career didn't quite go to the very top the way we thought it would a few years ago. But he, everything is still there. All the talent is still there. Yes. Uh, so, I, yeah, I, I, I agree. I think it has been a little bit of a disappointment given how much money he came for and how young he was when he moved from Blackburn. But yeah. there's still time. There's still time. Uh, and then to round out that back four, since I said it probably will be back four, my guess is it's going to be Daley Blint, Phil Jones in the middle, uh, Matteo Darmian on the left, and Antonio Valencia, Tony V on the right. <laughs> All right. So they're going to be up against some pace. Um, yep. Coming in from the wings, you've got Traore, who's on loan from Chelsea. He's on the right, and you've got Eunice coming in on the left. So these two guys, they're part of the press, obviously, when Ajax press. But when they have the ball, they are something to be scared of. Eunice is so good. He was ju- he's 23. He was just called up to the Germany squad for the Confederations Cup. He loves to sort of dribble infield from the left. So Antonio Valencia is going to have that sort of... You know that weird thing where fullbacks will try and show you outside all the time? Um, mm-hmm. and we've seen Valencia get caught on this a couple of times like instead Eunice will try and cut inside and it may take Valencia by surprise on the other wing Traore is so fast that I fear for Damian I think he's the most frightening Bertrand since uh, Stewie's brother and family guy and those are the only <laughs> two of the three Bertrands I can think of off the top of my head uh, but he is definitely the one that uh, scares me the most speaking as a Manchester United fan <laughs> I can't, I'm trying really hard to think of other Bertrands, and I can't. I think Ryan Bertrand is the only other one I can think of. <laughs> but not so scary, right? Uh, no, definitely not. <laughs> and while I'm just sort of um, outlining Ajax's attack, the man we talked about at the top of the show, Davy Klassen, 24 years old, captain of Ajax. He's now in the sort of Dutch national team as they start to try and rebuild this guy has a first touch, and oh boy, does he have a first touch. Again, the other half an hour I spent was watching Davy Klassen highlights. Very, very, very <laughs> impressive. I, you had I, a busy day today, huh? I, I, oh, a lot of YouTube. I just see him like bringing balls down all the time, like killer first touch. It's another one. Like um, they, they say that like uh, Dolberg is being coached by Bergkamp. I feel like mm-hmm. Davy Klassen just watched that Bergkamp goal against Argentina and just practiced, uh, <laughs> practiced uh, killing balls softly as they come out of the air. <laughs> Killing ball softly. That was uh, that was a, Robert, a Roberta Flack song, I think. <laughs> it's a Fu- Fuji's B side. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so yeah, look uh, look out for Davy Klassen. All right. Well, since you've talked about Ajax's attack, I suppose I should do the same with Manchester United. Um, it seems pretty straightforward, uh, but then again, who knows these things? It seems like, as I said, in the fourth, uh, 4-3-2-1 or 4-3-3, it seems like it's going to be Juan Mata and Enrique Mkhitaryan with Marcus Rashford ahead of them. Um, Anthony Martial might factor in there. Jesse Lingard could factor as well. I've seen a lot of people thinking that he does have this ability to kind of show up for the big games on the big stage. Who, Jesse so maybe Lingard? we'll see. Yeah. So maybe we'll see Jesse Lingard in there. I know, I know, I know. Pav's going to be mad. (laughs) But I think it's going to be important to have those sort of tricky, pacey players because by everything I've heard and read, Ajax's defense, while decent, is young, relatively inexperienced when it comes to playing against like truly potent attacks and also a little bit reckless in the challenge because that high press, that high intensity pressure system can lead defenders to make sort of rash challenges and really go aggressive for the ball. So that could mean drawing free kicks, drawing fouls and maybe getting exploited, like coming out too far and leaving space in behind. And I think those three players that I mentioned, Juan Mata, Enrique Mkhitaryan and Marcus Rashford are the most capable of exploiting those issues. I feel like you just stole my next point. Yeah, Ajax is 
is Ajax's defense is super young. I mean, the mm-hmm. the obvious like headline for youngsters <laughs> or like the the headline act in terms of youngsters is Matthias Delict. Um, he's the guy that he's seventeen. He's playing centre back to be to be playing centre back at seventeen in a top, top European flight is mind boggling. He's also played for the Dutch national team. He sort of famously had those couple of errors that cost the Dutch national team pretty recently. But that's just an example of what happens with a seventeen year old centre back, right? Yeah, a little bit. Yeah. Especially when you haven't been proven and then uh, what Daly, Danny Blint, Daly's father, then coaching the, the Dutch national team, just throws you in there and is like, good luck. See yep. what you can do. Don't whiff. <laughs> Don't make any mistakes. <laughs> his partner will be Davinson Sanchez who I think is only mm-hmm. 20 I'm sorry I don't have the exact number in front of me um, but believe it or not Taylor we've seen him play for Colombia's under 23s when they smashed the US under 23s in that we Olympic haven't. playoff and I so th- he was impressive enough that I have a very distinct memory of his defending against yep. the United States he was unbeatable that day the, sec- uh, he, he the was. second leg specifically he was. Uh, also, I just happen to know this in memory that his birthday is June 12th, 1996, which makes him 20 years old, and he's uh, six foot two. There's a Wikipedia ban in effect right now. <laughs> I don't know to what you're referring. <laughs> Especially since you just said it deliberately. <laughs> <laughs> they do, um, so they do have a couple of older guys. Um, yep. They have uh, Vesterman, he's 33. He could start instead of either of Delete or Sanchez um, as centre-backs. And they also have Lars Schoner um, in midfield. He is a whopping 30 years old. But apart from that, everyone is in their teens and early 20s. A whopping 30. Yeah. That's insane. <laughs> well, you got anything so, else for me, Taylor, on Manchester United? Yeah. I do. I, I, have, I have two quick things that kind of go hand in hand. Um, and it's uh, first of all, really quickly, I think under Herrera is going to be very important for that United midfield. I mentioned him earlier, but I think the player um, that does have the potential to really break this one wide open and one again, speaking as a United fan who I would really like to see break it open is Paul Pogba, because so much of this game is about basically dictates United's season. And that's why one of my points, my final point was that I genuinely think this is United's biggest game since the Champions League final in 2008. And keep in mind, they've played two other Champions League finals since then. <laughs> so I really do think this is the biggest game they've played in a very long time because why, it really why, does. Why, why? Because it dictates, I've seen, I've heard so many different like pods and uh, articles reviewing the league, sort of like giving out their grades like, oh yeah, they get an A, they get a B. And then they get to United and it's like, well, it depends on what they do in the Europa League. Oh, we did, this, we did that exact conversation yesterday. We did. And it, and it is sort of true that it's tough to grade their season because yes, they got sixth, but it seems like it was a deliberate attempt in the last month or so because they were focused on the Europa League. Mm-hmm. But if they don't do well, if they don't win here, then they don't qualify for the Champions League, which means this season was a failure. It also kind of shadows next season because you're not in the Champions League. You're probably not going to be able to bring in the kind of big name players like Antoine Griezmann, who kind of made reference to the idea this week, I think on Monday, that like if they qualify for the Champions League, he's probably playing for Manchester United next season yeah he said he said he wants to win trophies which seemed to be uh sort of an indirect reference to yeah i might join united if they win if they win the europa league and i think it was like there's a six in ten chance and we'll see what happens in the coming weeks oh you need to listen to this morning's goal math i watched the i watched the french tv show where he was asked um uh out of ten out of ten what what are the chances of you joining united so that's really interesting then. So, and I apologize for not listening yet. But so, do you think that that is more of a headline then than it is a true story, or do you think there is a little bit uh, smoke to the fire, or fire to the smoke? I think I think he was really put on the spot on a French yeah. TV show called, I believe, Quotidien. Um, I, can't, I can't remember the presenter's name. Um, and they literally asked him, sort of, on a scale of like zero to ten, um, how likely are you to join Manchester United? So Mm -hmm. he really was put on the spot. And I feel like in a good way, six was a good answer from Griezmann. Because it says that, yeah, this is probably happening. But it also, it wasn't so high that it's like definite. It's it's almost like he was able to like indicate that it's probably happening, but also still leave Atletico some leverage maybe to ask for money. Or does he have a buyout clause? I can't remember. Um, But maybe leave himself some leverage to ask for more salary. Yeah, I think he might have (laughs) a massively high buyout clause. That's that's rings a bell faintly in my head. But but like I want to so to go back to this game though for a second and why I think it's so important. So again, we talked about kind of like do we give them a pass or a fail? Was it a success or a failure in the season is what we did on that show. And we got to Arsenal and we were like, you know, it's probably a failure because they didn't qualify for Champions League. Even if they win the FA Cup, it's not great. 
And you think about United, if they lose this final, they won, what, the League Cup, the Carling Cup, the whatever it is Cup, the Community Shield, like, and then that's it. They finished sixth. They finished, what, the, the narrative I've heard a lot is like 21 points, 24 points behind Chelsea. So there's no other way to see this other than a failure of a season if they don't win the Europa League. All right. If mm. Ajax, if Ajax do win the Europa League, mm-hmm. then a certain goalkeeper that I know you're a big fan of, Cameroon mm-hmm. Andre Onana, yeah, will, buddy. I believe I've lightly researched this, only lightly, will be the first African keeper to win a European trophy, a UEFA trophy, since Bruce Grabelar for Liverpool way back when. Really? Yeah. Wait, so like as a as a goalkeeper? Sorry, yes. is that what you said? First African ah, goalkeeper. Sorry, I missed yeah. that. My mistake. Yeah, I was going to say, I feel like there's been a lot of African players <laughs> winning, winning the Champions League in years past. Yep. Gotcha. Yeah, I mean, and that makes sense. And and we talked about him a little bit when we did the Africa draft. But yeah, Andre uh, Onona, Cameroonian goalkeeper who supplanted Tim Krul, right? Tim Krul got injured. Onana then came in, basically held onto the starting spot, uh, starting spot, not starting spot. And Tim Krul was sold. He's he's no longer with Ajax because Onana has been so impressive. So he's a young goalkeeper, and I would say one for the future as well. Again, he's only twenty one. And I oh also I also enjoy that uh, you say Onana and I say Onana. Yeah, <laughs> well, you know. <laughs> It's a representative of our relationship, my friend. Let's call the whole thing off? No, I'm good with it. (laughs) So there you go. Anything else to add, Taylor, for our Man United Ajax preview? I think just from like an overall, like if you're just trying to get an idea of what's happening and what that means in the game, I think Ajax are going to do what Ajax do. They're going to be high intensity, high pressure, try to win the ball back as quickly as they can. I think for United, it could be one of two things. I think if they're sitting back, then it's going to be... A very nervy game for Manchester United fans, but I think for neutrals it will be exciting because it means Ajax, I think, are going to have more of the ball. They're going to get more of the opportunities. I think if you see United further forward early, not sitting back as much, then it means they're trying to win that game in the first half. And I think, again, either way, it's going to be a very captivating game. And we're going to watch, right? We're going to watch it live in studio together, I think is the plan, tomorrow afternoon, and then record a review show very soon afterwards. So you should, you should expect our Euro- Europa League final review show, I want to say like 6.30 p.m. Eastern. Mm-hmm. And, I, and I can't wait to uh, praise Paul Pogba and the brace he gets in this game. <laughs> to All justify right. that price tag. Absolutely. <laughs> Winning the Europa League this one game justifies that massive price tag. I mean, I guess we haven't talked about him too much in this preview, right? Nope. I still stand by. I'm a big Paul Pogba fan. Every time I've seen him too. this season, all the attributes I've seen in him, which are, you know, the strength, uh, creativity, yep. like really like... I want to call it like weird, quick thinking. Like he just has mm-hmm. odd ideas that often work out. He's kind of like David Lynch. He's like the David Lynch of midfielders. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just weird, yeah. weird passes that seem to come from nowhere. Um, and I, I really, really think it's not been the terrible season that everybody wants to paint it as because then that's a more dramatic story. And yeah, if yeah. he can end it by providing, even if he just provides a moment that like the layman soccer fan can remember in a European final, people will look back on this season as the season that he did that. I would be okay with that. <laughs> and that's speaking as a neutral, obviously. Obviously, Taylor, obviously. <laughs> All right, so this past Wednesday, Taylor, we were, yes. I think, professionally, technically neutral yep. when Christos FC, amateur team from Baltimore, came down to Richmond, Virginia to play the Richmond Kickers in the, the U.S. Open Cup second round. Yes, sir. We were doing the play-by-play and the color commentary between us. We were doing the commentary Mm -hmm. for this U.S. Open Cup game. First time we'd ever done it, right? So it was our U.S. Open Cup debut. We were all excited. Um, We'd also, we've been watching the kickers all season. They've been struggling, right? They've been struggling to score goals. I think they've only scored more than one goal once all season. And we kind of thought, okay, they're playing this amateur team. It's a good chance for the kickers to like start banging some goals in. Maybe this restarts our season, right? And then maybe a couple rounds from there, we'll be playing like a bigger team as well. We might get to see the kickers against an MLS team. That is not what happened, is it, Taylor? It is not. Maybe we weren't the only ones who were maybe looking past that opponent to the next round of the competition. Because yeah, in the end, it was Christos FC who got that 1-0 away victory. They certainly did, yeah. Christos FC scored in, I think, the last 10 minutes or so. Mm -hmm. But it really, and even though Kickers had some chances, it wasn't a fluke, right? Uh, Christos, this amateur team from Baltimore, literally none of the players are professional, although some of them have played like a few games in the USL and played college. None of them are professional right now. They're an official amateur team. They came and looked, they really looked up to standard to play against a USL team. They gave the Kickers a proper proper game went toe-to-toe for sort of effort and skill and smarts and came out the better team 
That is definitely accurate to the extent that we had heard they didn't train. We were surprised by that. We assumed that they did like three days a week or something like that because they did seem like they had a key plan for what they were going to do for how they were going to approach this game. And then we found out that's definitely not the case. <laughs> well, all will be revealed um, because I, I phoned up Peter Karingi the third centre forward mm-hmm. for Christos FC. This is the guy that scored a hat trick against uh, Fredericksburg FC in the first round, um, and he was nice enough to talk to me for like twenty minutes or so to explain sort of how Christos FC, this amateur team, approached that Open Cup game and how they pulled it off, including like how guys got the days off work, what the plan was, how often they do train. So listen now to my interview with Pete Karingi, and maybe he'll tell you how to pull off a giant killing. Team men's soccer, this is Pete. Hey Pete, this is Daryl from Total Sock Show. How you doing? I'm good, how are you? Pretty good, thanks. Um, I'm still stinging from last Wednesday when you came down to Richmond and, and beat my local team. But apart <laughs> from that, I'm pretty good. <laughs> uh, how you sorry doing? about that. <laughs> I'm good, how are you? <laughs> I'm great. So that's what I want to talk to you about today, Pete. I want to talk about sort of how you guys pulled that off, but also a little bit about the team Christos FC. So can we, can we start there? Can we start with um, exactly what Christos FC is? Because it's you, you guys are an amateur team with a lot of talent. So I'd love to know how that came about and you know what the story behind the team is. Okay, so I know it started in 1997, so it's 20 years this year. Um, it's just a bunch of local guys that kind of got together just to play amateur men's league and the state leagues and all that. Um, I know they've had good players here and there overall. See, Baltimore doesn't have a professional team, so there's some guys that kind of just go play men's league in Baltimore when they want to stay in the city because there's really a lot of guys overall that like being in the city and living in the city. So, I mean, either it doesn't work out for them playing or some of them want to just stay around and have a job in Baltimore. So it's grown. And then now it's kind of got to the point where the last two years we've had a lot of players that have either got drafted, played pro, played USL, and played other leagues that have kind of come home, got coaching jobs, got other jobs that were a little more money and a little more substantial of the life than the USL because some of the contracts some guys got probably weren't the best quality of living and right. people came back to live in Baltimore and got jobs. And when we had that much talent join the team uh, probably two years ago, uh, it made our team really good. I mean, we had a lot of, like I said, ex-pros that are still in their young 20s. So we went on a run of not losing a single game and everything, and then we went to both the Amateur Open Cup and the Amateur Nationals, and we won both. And when that all happened, we won every game, and everyone then started to kind of notice us more. So then we went to the – we registered for the U.S. Open Cup and the other things, and we're still – we actually lost our first game out of like 80 or 90 in April. Just one of those games that just didn't happen. But to be fair, it might have worked it out at the right time because it made us a little hungrier again, which has right. happened in May and now and all that. So it's, like I said, it's been crazy. We've just kind of, the last two years has probably been the real push when a lot of us came in and joined. And we had some guys from another team come and merge with us too from Baltimore and now we just have a team that has played with each other, has a lot of chemistry from the last couple of years, whether it's in college, high school. I mean, most of the guys I've played with on Christos now, I've probably played with at one point in my life. So it's not like it's a bunch of random people to get together. A lot of us have played with each other and won with each other at different levels, whether it's with the Baltimore Bays, winning national championships in club, or what, so most of us, a lot of us went to UMBC and won a lot of conference titles. And some of the guys made the Final Four in 2014 in the division one. So it's a lot of guys that have won and came together, wanted to be in Baltimore, have good jobs. And here we are now. So before we talk about the kickers game specifically, um, I want to ask you, you, you said like we made the decision to register for the open cup. And I'm sure a lot of our listeners like won't be familiar with the process of an amateur team getting into the open cup. So was it sort of winning that amateur cup? Is that what qualified you? Or was it something else that qualified you to go into was it you entered the first round and played Fredericksburg, or was it before that? No, so I'm not going to be a, I'm going to be 100 percent honest. I'm not 100 percent sure about it, but I know that <laughs> you, you just have t- to you qualify. Just turn up and score goals. I, yeah, I know <laughs> you have to qualify uh, by having a good like a great resume. I see. So you got to. So obviously, we had the best resume of them all. So I think that helped us qualify to get in. 
And then we know before Fredericksburg, we had to play two games uh, just to get to that round. So in reality, we've already played four Open Cup games, but only two of the rounds are registered. So we played a round. We played one in September, and then when we won that, we played one. I think in about could have been in March. Could have been sometime before that. But we've already played. Uh, this uh, technically Richmond was our fourth game, but obviously, like I said, they only really count the rounds against the MPSL, PDL teams and up, which, I mean, I understand completely. But a lot of the men's league teams and other teams like that that do qualify have to play against each other to then play in the, well, technically first round, but reality third round. Got it. And then you got to the, um, officially the second round, right, which is where you drew the Richmond kickers. And I want to talk to you about sort of game day. Um, So it was this past Wednesday um, is, is it a deal where, like, you've all got to drive down... You're in Baltimore, right? So you've all got to drive down 95 mm-hmm. South. Does everybody, have to, does everybody have to sort of somehow get the day off work and to, to make sure they can leave early, to make sure they can be on time? Mm-hmm. Like, I've been in that traffic as well. Like, is there a chance that, like... You know, I, I play on a Sunday team, obviously a much, much lower level than you guys, but sometimes our guys are late because they're in traffic. Like, was there ever a chance that, like, Saunders, the goalkeeper, isn't going to be there for kickoff because he's, he's in traffic on 95? You know what I mean? For for those open cup, I mean, there's been other games before. The, for I guess for our men's league, for the amateur cup and stuff, that's probably almost happened. But I'd say for this open cup, we've taken it as serious as possible. And that being said, we should probably still take a little more serious, a little more things. But with those open cup games on Wednesdays, yeah, guys, some guys have to take off work, um, and that's two straight Wednesdays. Wednesdays for some guys that they probably can't afford, but they they did. And then we have a Wednesday game next week now, so they got to figure that out. But um, because oh, this could be days off a, unpaid, right? If you've got no vacation left, you just gotta you just gotta take the day. I guess off it depends. It. I guess it de- some guys, yes, yeah, some guys know it depends what job they have. So, uh, yes, yeah, some guys are like really happy and they're playing well for us, but then they're also like stressing out that now they have to figure out how to tell their boss for another Wednesday that they're not going to be <laughs> in the work because as much as this is a big thing in the country, especially for soccer, there might be some jobs that some guys have that. Their co- their uh, coach, yeah, their uh, <laughs> their boss doesn't even know what the Open Cup is and probably doesn't even care. Right? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, for that game, for the Richmond game, we had so our manager always gets like a team, like a big van for like the games. So like the first game for Fredericksburg, I drove down myself because I ha- I couldn't go in the team van, but this time I did, and we had about twelve, thirteen people, and then our other we have two coaches. Our other coach drove like four guys, and then there's probably only three people on this one that drove their own cars because they had to. So it was a little better on this one. But the Fredericksburg one was probably a lot more uh, hectic overall. But, I mean, yeah, we we text each other and all that, try to tell us what time to get there to make sure we're there early because we know the registration rules are a lot more strict right. in the Open Cup than some amateur games where they say regist- you you got to check in at 4 and the game's at 5 and you get there at 4.30, you can still check in. So so what, um, how early did you guys have to get there for this game? Say that again, sorry. How early did you have to get there? Like, how long before kickoff for the Richmond game? Um, I think we got there two hours prior. We always try to leave because we know, we know how bad that traffic can be, so we right. don't want to risk anything, especially with how big our van was. So we'll get down there a little early sometimes. We went to go eat and everything. So, yeah, I mean, if guys are going to get off, they're going to get off a little earlier just to go do that. So, and then yeah, I want we to... probably got there two hours before game time. And then I want to get into some tactical stuff, but before I want to ask you about sort of the mentality going into it. Was it that you guys were thinking, all right, we've seen the kickers aren't doing so well this year, we can take these guys? Or was it like, hey, we'll just go out there and sort of, you know, give it our best, see what happens against this professional team? I don't, I don't, I don't think we really looked at Richmond struggling lately. I mean, I know I've, me and a couple other guys have played in that league, and even if you're a struggling team, you still have obviously quality guys. And I think even though they're struggling, they still have quality guys on that team. And it wasn't even one of that. We might have just caught him at the right time. But I just think that, in all honesty, we just feel like when we play together that we can beat whoever we're playing against. So I think we just had the right mentality. We caught them at the right time. And, I mean, they were one or two shots that they had right in front that they could have easily won. And we got our chance and finished. And it was just one of those games where we had the right mindset and things happened our way. And they... I think they do. I think they came out prepared. I think there's guys on their team that have played in the local Baltimore area, whether someone went to the University of Maryland or other schools, and they know who was on our team. So I don't think they were downplaying it that much. I just think it's one of those games that 
that's the beauty of it that we had our team and we were ready to play and we got the result so can we talk tactics because the thing that we noticed because i don't know if you know this but i was in the commentary booth so i did the play-by-play so you know i've had a lot of attention to what happened this game i noticed you guys sort of not taking certain counter-attacking opportunities and not deliberately not over committing men forward as if you guys were thinking like we don't want to like get caught on a counter counter and give something up early so was there sort of um, a big game plan for this, or am I reading too much into what I saw? Uh, I'd say a little bit of both. I think we were just trying to slow it. We're used to, obviously, if you know men's league, men's league's a lot slower than the USL. Yeah. So I think we're used to slowing it down and having the better players in that kind of league to slow it down and then draw them to us and then, then go. But we knew that in this game it wasn't going to be as easy as those games. So... We just kind of tried to control it and slow it down a little bit in the midfield when we could. Obviously, in the beginning, you're trying to take some time out of the game because the longer the game goes, you do know the other team's struggling, so you know they're going to be put more pressure. You you do yeah. know that they had the pressure on them to win, regardless if they were struggling or not, because they're a USL team, we're a men's league team. So yeah. they're going to have more pressure. And we knew the longer we went in that game, we also knew it was a little hot early, so we knew if we could just get to the second half, it would be a lot easier too. So... I wouldn't say that we deliberately try to not counter. I just think that we knew we've had guys in this situation before to know, okay, if we get by this first half and play well, but we are tied or we'd be up or whatever, then we'll be good. And the longer this game goes, the more pressure is going to be on them, especially, yeah, knowing that they were not getting the results they wanted lately. So they thought that this should be the result, and if they're struggling at the end of the game, which they were, you could tell that the pressure was – mounting a little bit you could see them start yelling at each other and yeah. the coach yelling and all the fans you could tell the fans were getting more pissed off and it was one of those things you're like all right now we have them where we want them let's play this game and it, it kind of opened up more and then you saw when the goal happened again it kind of put everything in together and what what was your role because i noticed you you were sometimes up front but you were sometimes like adding yourself to the midfield and you occasionally sort of popped up on the wing so did you have a defined role in that game so so i mean Technically, my role is the striker on the team, but uh, I'm probably the best guy in the air aerial for winning head balls. So there'd yeah. be times that I would drop back um, for the headers because we had a very, if you could tell, we had a very small midfield yeah, and yeah. very small center backs against a lot bigger guys that were talented. So uh, once we scored, I know the last probably eight, we scored like 12 minutes left. I think it was like eight minutes to go. I just went to go play center back because I said they're, they're just going to put balls in and we don't have the guys to win those balls. So I just went back there just to uh, win the aerial balls and get them out because by then I don't I didn't care about scoring anymore. I just wanted to <laughs> get that one nothing win and get out of there. So I'll drop back. I mean, there's times I'll play center mid at the end of games just to win the head balls and then I got to run back up on our own goal kicks to win our own. But, <laughs> yeah, I mean, obviously I'm more of in center, but – I like to move in and out because, I mean, I play with the guys wide for a good amount of time, and when they like to make runs through, I don't want to get in their way. I'll let them do that and mix it up. So, overall, I am a target forward, but by the end of the game and other times, I'm moved around in different spots depending on the situation. Got it. I also I want to ask about Daniel Baxter. So, Daniel Baxter, number five, right, um, last mm-hmm. week, um, was theoretically right midfield. And was right midfield for most of the game, but we saw him go for several sort of wonders and just pop up on the left wing, where he would you'd have mm-hmm. like two left wingers and no right winger. And I was really, I was wondering, is that was that a deliberate strategy, or was that just is that how Daniel Baxter just handles his business? No, I'll, that's what I'm saying. That's why this team, and honestly, is awesome. Just because, in all honesty, we don't have we we don't go into it saying this is your role. I've been on teams before where this is what you're going to do. You're staying here. You're going to make this run. You're going to do that. And I completely get that, and that's a good way to play. But for this team. I mean, with Dan Baxter, I played with Dan Baxter since I was 14 years old. So I know exactly what he's going to do. And I played with the two guys under me in midfield since I was probably 15 years old. And the left mid I played with since I was 18 years old. So it's like you kind of just know what they're comfortable with, and you just go with it instead of saying, you're going to do this, you're going to do this. You just kind of know now. So that's why our team's been kind of successful, because we haven't really practiced a ton compared to other teams. We haven't really uh, had the – situations to get together and be like we're going to do this game plan we just kind of know how we're going to play and if we have to adjust during a game we'll adjust during a game but otherwise it really is just us knowing so he just did that and we just knew he was going to do it and we <laughs> adjust so yeah so you mentioned you guys don't practice as much it sounds like you don't have like you know a really drawn up like hardcore 
um, strategy, but it's more about familiarity, like you guys have played with each other a lot. I'm going to guess, looking at the roster, that it's a lot of uh, UMBC guys. Yeah, I mean, I think at that game we just had, there might have been seven on that roster. Yeah. And there's been other there's been plenty of other ones before. So yeah, I mean that's one of our main uh main groups of people and then we have a lot of other local uh colleges around that uh have players. So we I mean a lot of us have played club together, played high school together, either college together or played against each other in college and then came back together. So I mean, like I said, we really are familiar with how everyone is and we know how to play with each other, so it helps it work. And for the practice-wise, I think we tried it early on, and it just – people couldn't either – like, we would try to practice during the week, but we just could never find times to get the right amount of people or right. the certain days, which it's kind of sad, but at the same time, then we kept winning. And after we kept winning, we kept joking about, well, we haven't practiced yet, and we keep winning, so we're not going to – we're kind of the superstitious. Let's not change anything. <laughs> and then we won amateur nationals and the open, amateur open without – and we won every single game or at least tied a couple without uh, practicing. So we said, screw it. Let's just keep going for it. So the and, superstition is not to practice. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> it is. we never said it, but in reality, we're like, we haven't done it. I mean, there's times, even with the amateur nationals, the teams that were practicing down there and getting ready, and the guy was like, you guys want practice times? And we're like, we haven't done it yet. We're just not going to do it now. Like we, it's not, Basically, if something's working, I think we just stuck with it. And as crazy as it sounds, the thing that <laughs> thing that was working was us not training. Now, we should probably, I mean, these later rounds, if we beat the Chicago team, I know we played D.C. not in next. So we might have to, some guys might have to get together for that. But, uh, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it's been, it really is crazy because, obviously, especially at this level, uh, playing a team like Richmond, you would think that we, a men's league team, had to be practicing probably three, four times a week and getting ready. It just hasn't worked like that. Now, some of us, I mean, I work at UMBC, so I would train with the team here. And some of the guys, the alumni and stuff, will like do their trainings and everything. So it's not like anyone's just not training or not doing anything. People, we know people are like going to the gym, running, like doing a bunch of different stuff. Yeah. But as a team together with a game plan and the actual practice, now I mean, it really it hasn't happened yet. So. So I'd love to ask you about the sort of ambitions of guys on the team because, from what I understand, like a lot of guys played at University of Maryland, Baltimore County. Um, I know you you were drafted right in 2014. Um, MLS yeah. and you played for Oklahoma City Energy I think uh, in the USL yep. and I know a few of the other guys played USL as well but are now um, playing for Christos FC like does anyone have like see this as a springboard where like oh hey I could get noticed and maybe get back on a USL roster or is that sort of not something that anyone's thinking about anymore um I'd say people are still thinking about it I think if the I think some of the guys have been the USL is kind of rough I mean obviously there's guys that go in the USL move out to MLS and that is awesome for them, and they will be praised by the league. But I think there's also other guys, and if, if you've been covering, you can attest to that, that don't – they can make the team, but other guys are playing over them, don't get the chance, and then the money's not great, and you're just sitting. I mean, there's some guys like that sit in other cities, they're not playing, and they're wondering why I'm not back in a city that I love where I could probably be coaching and doing other stuff and making money compared to making minimum minimum yeah. and not playing. So it kind of – kind of make, gets a bad taste in your mouth and then you move back home i mean coaching there's great clubs here in baltimore coaching opportunities there are other great things so but i think if the right opportunity came along for any of these guys they at least consider if not go do it no i think there's plenty, i think there's guys on our team that would definitely uh want to go back out and pursue that i mean you can't you can't just say no to that without thinking about it. it's a professional opportunity and like i said a lot of the guys are still 25 and under for the most part so i mean even though they got their jobs and everything that's that's something you couldn't uh you couldn't say no to right away so i mean i think any of us would if we had the right opportunity the right place and the right time would uh, really consider that but yeah right now we're just focusing on going as far as you can in this and see now how much longer we can uh we can chase this uh, am i right in thinking you're working at umbc right now doing some coaching uh, yeah, I'm the, I'm the uh, second assistant coach. So there's our head coach, our first assistant, which is our associate head coach, and then there's me, and I'm the, I'm the second assistant. Got it. And I noticed the, the head coach is also named Peter Karingi. Yep, that'd be my dad. <laughs> it seems like he – did he coach you growing up as well? Actually, oh, he coached me here when I played here, but besides that, no, he never coached me until I got to college. He, he kind of – I think he – did something that I wish more parents would do and leave their children alone. 
right. while they're growing up and trying to play. So he did that, and I thank him a lot for that. Even when I was younger, I would he would only talk about my games when I was young if I asked for advice. But he wouldn't just be like, you should have did this, 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 this. He's, he would kind of let me figure it out on my own, but help me out whenever I needed it. And I think that worked out perfectly compared to how I'm seeing it now where some parents are trying to – act like they have a PlayStation controller and control their kids <laughs> yeah, do you know completely. What? Uh, so. This is slightly off topic, but um, I, I saw um, a photo shared around uh, on Twitter the other day of Leo Messi and Luis Suarez, and they'd both gone to watch their kids playing for like a Barcelona. Like, yeah, I saw that, team. and they were just chilling there. Yep. Yeah, just kicking back, not like telling them to do anything. Yeah. And really? a, lot of us that, a lot of us that like got successful with all that had parents that kind of just relax. I mean, you'll get the ones that are crazy, and those kids will work out. But, I mean, overall – there's a lot of kids I grew up with that had really strict parents and you got to do this. You got to go, you got to go to practice five times a week and do individual sessions the other two days. And they were really good. And by 13, 14, they were burnt out with soccer and didn't want anything to do with it. So no, I mean, I think parents need to chill out when it comes to that. And I mean, my, like I said, my name and coach me until I was 18. So I think that worked out perfectly. <laughs> and by then I was a man already that was ready to, that knew exactly what I had to do. So, Speaking of, um, I want to look ahead to the the next game. I know it's Chicago FC United, which I believe is like the Chicago Fire U23 team in the in the PDL. Um, how mm-hmm. how soon is that game coming up? So that's uh, not this Wednesday, but the Wednesday after. So this is our first week where we actually don't have any games for a while because even though we've been playing in the Open Cup, we had all these amateur men's league games. We still have a regional final for the regional Open Cup. Um. So we have other little games and stuff to play. So it's not like we're just not only playing this. Yeah. But next week will be crazy because that Chicago United team, I believe, and I could be wrong, but I believe is in the we're in a four team tournament next weekend as well for uh, the winner. So it's the winner of the winner of the amateur open, winner of the PDL, MPSL, and then maybe the 23 league. And Chicago United's in that too, and so are we. So we'll play them Wednesday in Chicago. The next day, we'll fly to Cleveland on Thursday, and then we'll play uh, the Cleveland team. And the winner of us two plays the winner of the Michigan Bucks and that Chicago team again. So there's a chance we could play them twice in the same week. I think they're the team that's in as well. So we might have to play them twice in the same week in two different cities for two different events. So next week's going to be crazy with, like I said, you talk about people getting off work. We have... We're traveling Tuesday, we're playing Wednesday, we're traveling Thursday back just to travel Thursday night to Cleveland, playing Friday. If we win, I think, you know, if we lose, we play Saturday regardless, and then we fly back Sunday. So that's a, that's a professional schedule right there for guys that aren't professionals. <laughs> and then the prize, the prize if you beat the U23 team is D.C. United in the fourth round. Mm-hmm. That's, that's pretty that's, exciting, right? That's what, uh, that's that's going to be crazy around here because I know even growing up, as much as D.C. and I is the closest MLS team to us, I know Baltimore and D.C. just have a rivalry when it comes to, yeah, yeah. I mean, if you watch even Academy now when Armour plays D.C., they'll get fan. I mean, D.C. versus Baltimore has always been a rivalry. So I think even though we would be heavy underdogs in that, I think we could get a very good crowd from Baltimore <laughs> coming up to that just because, It'd be the first time that they could have a team play against a D.C. team. So that would be crazy to happen. And that's obviously the goal is to get to that and just see what we could do. But we're not going to – we've got to get to that Chicago team first because they're, they're still in it for a reason, beating Pittsburgh Riverhounds as well. And they're in the tournament we're in that weekend as well. So obviously they're, they're doing pretty well for themselves. So, yeah, the goal is to obviously get to D.C., but we're not going to overlook next week with having three games, but especially that one with the Open Cup. I know um, Michael Lieber has set up um, a GoFundMe to make sure that you know there's enough money to get you guys to Chicago and make sure that all that goes mm-hmm. smoothly. I think you guys, as of this morning, you were almost at the goal. Is that right? I actually just they just think they just posted that we got it. Oh, nice! Congratulations. Yeah, thank you. I mean, yeah, that was I mean that was kind of crazy. I did not think that that was going to happen. I just think with all the travel costs for that, and then the travel costs for that weekend. And then it's just been a lot lately for a club that obviously is not professional and not really bringing in income. So it gets kind of ridiculous. And I know they don't want – it would suck for the players that to put up a lot of money because be, there's a lot of players that can't do that on our team. Yeah. So it would, it'd be, it's kind of an awkward situation that you're still in it. But 
money wise it's really hard but no i mean he put that up and i was shocked that i was honestly shocked we got that much i know people are supporting us around here because like i said there's not a pro team around here so the fact that we're doing this right now is pretty big in baltimore so i know i thought some people would support but i mean they had sasha collation put 500 dollars on there i saw he said so. what do you say good luck as long as you don't come up against me yeah, I know. So I'm just saying, you, I, like I would, you wouldn't, I would have never even guessed that that would have happened. Like I just, I'm just saying, it was, it was great with the support, and you kind of see how, I mean, they say our country doesn't care about soccer as much as other countries, which is probably true in the, in the grand scheme of things. But you see people from all over donating for a team for the Open Cup, and it kind of shows you like how big, how far soccer really has come to support teams like us going against, going to travel and do these things because they. They root for the underdog, and they like to see things like this. So it's it's pretty cool. That was really cool just to see that because I never thought they'd hit that goal, but it happened, and it happened in three days. I thought it'd take a lot longer than that. So it really worked out, and I'm real grateful for that. All right, people, thank you so much for taking the time to, uh, to talk to me today, and sincerely, best of luck in the next round. I really hope it goes well for you guys. All right, perfect. Thank you very much. Thank you. Have a good day. All right. All right, take care. Bye-bye. Bye. So there you go, that was Pete Karingi, centre forward for Christos FC, who are now officially the Total Soccer Show's favourite team left in the US Open Cup. They play Chicago FC United next Wednesday, May 31st, in the third round of the US Open Cup. We mentioned um, a GoFundMe page to help make sure that the players have enough money to get to Chicago and back. Um, I will put a link to that GoFundMe page in the show notes. Hope you've enjoyed today's show. Taylor and I will be back tomorrow with a review of that Europa League final. Hope you'll join us again then. 